so glad to be here uh, to see you all in this beautiful church. Uh, once again, my name is David, and we are in the book of uh, this book that my friend wrote from Westgate, uh, uh, Dave Tish, and we are in this series learning more about Abraham and through Abraham learning what it means to really love and follow after God, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and we took a break a little bit and now we're back at it. And uh, I just want to say, um, just like as we are coming in with this rain, we needed this rain, huh? Right? We, California, oh boy, we needed this rain. We're grateful for the rain. Thank you, Jesus. And, and as, I, as I was driving, and I'm, I'm just praying, God, that you would also, like this rain pouring down the, on this dry land, that you would pour your spiritual rain on us this morning. That, that God, that you would, we're all thirsty for more of God. We're all thirsty for more of his presence. That God would just rain down by his spirit through his grace and that he would fill us up. I have no idea where, where you've been and what your journey is, but we know that all of us, we need more of God. And so I pray that prayer. So would you pray with me as we begin this time? God, we thank you for the partnership of churches, uh, Westgate, Calvary. God, we thank you for... Uh, the, the folks that are not only in this room, but watching online, we ask for more of your presence. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for your spirit that is, that is here with us. God, we pray, God, that this morning that we would encounter you and that our lives will be transformed. God, we know that, that, that David Kim can't do anything and, and that my words cannot transform anyone, but Jesus, you can. So we, we just ask that Jesus be exalted in this place, that your name be lifted high, and that through you and through your love that we would be ever so changed. God, we are so tired of going in and out of cha- uh, church, God. We want to be transformed. So make, make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, wow, this is a great group. <laughs> Um, so I, so many years ago when I was a youth pastor, uh, we took a mission trip to New York City and, um, and yeah, mission trip to New York City. And, and we went there and, and kind of the final day, final day of our mission trip was that we would go drive in and see Hillsong worship team. Any worship team? Do you guys know Hillsong? Right? We sing a ton of their songs and we love their songs. And so I told the students that we're going to see Hillsong worship team live. They've never, they've sang the songs growing up in their youth group, but they've never seen the Hillsong worship team live. And so this was a big surprise and we're all getting ready. It's Saturday morning, we're in Long Island, and we take a train station. We're going to take this train, sta- uh, train all the way into the city, and they come only an hour, every hour. So we're there on Sunday, and we get there. There's about 20 of us where everybody's just so excited. They've been waiting pretty much six months for this big day. I'm the youth pastor. I'm excited, too. I've never seen them live before. I've, and their songs have tremendously impacted and shaped my faith and my journey with Jesus. And so we're all excited. And then all of a sudden, uh, we are waiting, and then the announcement comes out that due to some technical difficulties, that the train will no longer be in service. And so, and they said there are no more trains coming. And so we are all there, and of, of course, all the students, they all look at me, and, and I look at them, and, and we're, I'm, I'm confused, and I'm trying to process this out loud. Uh, I could see in their faces that we're all, uh, they're disappointed, and we're stuck. We're in Long Island. There's no way we're going to get to this, so we're going to miss it. And we're there, and we're about 30 minutes in and uh, from the train coming, but obviously now we're just stuck. And I just looked at them and said, do you think God would bring us all the way out here to be disappointed? And then as soon as I said that, I said, oh I said, do you believe that God is powerful and that, that he's not going to just abandon us in the middle of Long Island? Where is Long Island anyways? And, and then do you believe that God's going to make a way? Do you believe in God's miracles and power? And, and all of a sudden the kids are like, Pastor, yes. And I'm going, uh-oh, right? And, 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 I'm, and, I'm, and, and so they're saying yes and they're excited. And one of the kids go, uh, Pastor, we should pray. We should pray that somehow the train shows up in 30 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, we should pray because God answers our prayers, doesn't he? And they're like, yeah, uh-oh. And so we all grab hands. We're in the middle of this, the, the train station, and we're all making this circle, and we start praying 
out loud and we're saying, God, we want to see this worship team and we want to sing songs of praise to you. You're not going to just leave us here. You're a good father. And we've come all the way from California to New York City and we're all, all so excited for this journey. And we're about 20 minutes into the prayer. And I look up just to see if there's been any new announcements. And there's kind of this screen projector and it still says that our train out of service. Now we're five minutes left and I'm praying and I'm closing my eyes and I'm saying, God, please, like have your way here. Or we're, what am I gonna do? What are you gonna do? And God's like, I don't know, this, this is you, right? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't promise them anything. And, and so uh, uh, you, you've brought this upon yourself and your youth ministry. And so now I'm four minutes in and three minutes in, all of a sudden we hear something on the loudspeakers your train will be coming in in two minutes. Wow. Out of nowhere, right? Out of service, right? And kids like just drop their hands. They're like, we, yeah, and like, and then, and then they're all screaming and they're like, Pastor David, did you know this? I'm like, absolutely, I knew this was gonna happen, right? <laughs> of course, I was scared and nervous um, and, and, and I'm grateful that God uh, moved and we all know, as you have journeyed with God for many years, many of you longer than I have, you know that God is a God of miracles, and he can do anything and everything, and we see that in the scriptures, we see that in the book of Genesis. At the same time, we also know that many times, God sometimes doesn't come through in such a miraculous way. We know that sometimes in life, we are, there are, we are filled with disappointments, confusions, prayers that are unanswered. How many of you have experienced that? A death of a loved one, frustrations at work, things going on in the church world with leaders, uh, difficulties of relationship, things that are going on in your family, troubles in marriage, uh, with parenting. I'm married, I have two kids, and during COVID, and all the stuff that's going on, I understand, and we pray, we seek the Lord, we're faithful, but sometimes, if we're being honest, we are also met with disappointments, right? And so, not all of our faith stories are like the ones where we're in Long Island praying and God shows up. We wish it was every time, but it's not the case. And so, I share that story because we are following through our hero, right? The father of our faith, Abraham, and and there has been some crazy things, like miracles after miracles happening. God shows up out of nowhere. God speaks to Abraham. God is uh, ushering him out. He promises him that, that your descendants will be numerous. Like the stars. And God is doing amazing things. And you get to this interesting story in Genesis 16, where now Abraham and Sarah, they're waiting for their child, and God has promised them, and they are now filled with disappointment. Wait a minute, God's been doing a lot of amazing things. Now we're stuck, we don't have a child, and we thought you're good, and we thought you're gonna move, and we thought that you keep your promises, but we are stuck and nothing seems to go well. And when humans, when all of us, like Abraham, when we are met with some frustrations and difficulties, when our lives, when things don't make sense, we often do one of three things. So today, we're gonna to be reading this text, and I hope that, by the way, let me just say this. Mm, this is a difficult text. Um, and some of you, as I read the verses, some of you might get angry, some of you might be disappointed, some of you, there might be different emotions that may come up for you as we read this text. I hope, that as whatever is coming up, that you don't just sit with that, but you invite God into the process. And I hope that this text will be a mirror to what may be going on in your journey, in my journey. So with that, would you join me in Genesis 16? Now, Sarah, Abraham's wife, I'm gonna, as you know, their names are now changed, right? Sarah, Abraham's, so I'll be using their names. But in this text, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, verse 1, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. 
perhaps I can build a family through her. Pause. Right? They are now this interesting dynamic that's happening in the family. Where is God? We thought God is good. We thought God is on the move. God has promised us children. Nothing is happening. Now we're getting old, and life is not working out the way we expected it to work out. The life of faith, we thought that God would always show up, is not happening. And so when that happens to us, and, and to me, and to all of us in our journey, we know that, that some of us, we lean into kind of the posture of what we see in Abraham's wife, Sarah, right? The Lord has kept me from having children, so first we blame God. So there may be some of us here in this room that something's not working in your journey, and you have said, you know what? It's God's problem, and God is not good, and God is not working out, and it is, it is actually God to blame. And so... Sarah says, the Lord has kept me from having children, and here is what she does instead. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And what, she, what does she do? She takes matters into her own hands. So when things are not working, some of us, we take the posture of Sarah. We take matters into our own hands. We control the outcome. We try to figure out what God is trying to do, and we just react, and we take matters into our own hands, and we force the situation. Well, I'm going to just bring a slave, even though that's not the way God, God is going to bring his descendants. God promised them it would be through her, but she has, she's waiting for a while, and nothing's happening, so she's going to force God's hand. So we take control we take the posture of the Lord and Master, and many of us, as we read the story, if that's you in this room, man, that's a mirror that we're saying, Lord, God, if that's me, God, would you invite me to the process of confession and reflection that I, maybe some of you at home, maybe you are a leader at this church. I have no idea what your journey is, but when things are not going well, you like to take a little bit more of control. Hmm. Let's go to the following. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So Abraham had been living in Canaan for 10 years. Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her, to, uh, gave her to her husband to be with his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. Now, we have another response, right? The second response is like the response of Abraham. So far, he's been the hero of our faith, and we see such a disappointing story. But actually, it's supposed to be an encouragement to us that even great leaders fail. Only Jesus is perfect. This is a reminder that even a, the hero, the father of our faith, Abraham, he has a disappointing kind of a posture here. And what he does is that even though he should be waiting for God's promises to unfold, he just says, you know what, Sarah, if that's what you want, okay, I'll just sleep with Hagar. And he becomes very passive in his posture, in his journey with God. So he just says, okay, I'll just do that. I will not lead. I will not speak against it. I will not say, hey, that's not what we've agreed to. That's not what God has promised. He doesn't discern. He doesn't step in to say, no, that's not how we do things. We have to lean in. And kind of this story reminds you of a little bit of Genesis 2 and 3, doesn't it? Right? It's a similar story that's happening before us. And so Abraham just agreed to do that, and he becomes passive in his posture. And when she knew, uh, verses following, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abraham, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now she knows she's pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. So Sarah is now blaming Abraham. Right, so we have uh, we have uh, we have one individual like Sarah who likes to blame others, take control, and when things fall apart, they don't take any responsibility. We have another individual like Abraham when things are going wrong, can't speak up, is very passive to the conversation. And by the way, I can relate to both. If you're like, wait, what about if I can relate to both? Oh, we we all need Jesus here, right? Uh, 
Uh, sometimes I could see myself being a little bit more in control and, oh God, please have your way in me sometimes. I'm very passive. I'm actually conflict avoidant naturally. How many of you are conflict avoidant uh, here in this room? We're all clapping. Yeah. <laughs> Right? So you understand Abraham, like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just gonna let this thing happen and just uh, go from there. I don't like conflict. And especially last two years of all the conversations about masks, vaccines, politics, race, and just everything that's happening. Like for me, it's like, man, there's like tension everywhere and the things can get really intense. And for me, instead of saying the right thing, instead of speaking up, I let sometimes things happen. Like some of you in this room, you are going through stuff at your home and God is inviting you, if you're in the posture of Abraham, to stand. That God is with you. That some of you, you're facing something at work. There's some kind of injustice or there's, you see something that's happening that's a wrongdoing. That God is saying, no, don't take the posture of Abraham. That you would stand and you would say, actually, that's not the way we, would, we live in this world. Some of you, maybe you're doing something and you see something at church. And you're like, oh, I don't think that's the right way to follow after Jesus. But you're like, you know what? But if I stand up to that, that's going to cause conflict with leadership. I might get in trouble. I might get fired if you're a staff here. I mean, you're going through all sorts of things like Abraham. And so we all relate to the story, actually. But it's really a painful to have a mirror to all of us. You're like, David, I thought we we're going to have a great morning. What are you doing here? I mean, this is what they gave me, <laughs> right? This is the text they gave me. So I'm just reading it, guys, <laughs> right? That's all I'm doing. I'm just obeying my leaders. <laughs> and I'm conflict avoidant, so I'm just doing what they told me to do, <laughs> right? <laughs> Teach this text, okay, right? And so maybe you're that. And man, like just being honest um, with all the um, racial stuff that was happening last year and, and, um, and as an Asian American, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm Asian American. Uh, and and uh, just kind of the, all the hate crimes that was happening in our community, I wanted to speak up, but like even though it was my own community, I was afraid of what that would that might cost. I understand the cultural climate. I understand many Christians have a different perspective. And even though it was like, I called my mom in New York and my mom's like, I'm afraid to go to Costco. Somebody at our church got beat up. And, I, and I'm listening to that and I wanna it kind of begin some conversations, but I'm having a hard time. I see myself like Abraham, like things are happening to my own community and I can't even lean in, you know? Like I'm a coward. And I look at this text, I'm going, Lord, please have mercy on me. Because there's an area to grow for all of us in this journey. And actually, the author of this book, the Abraham book that we're all doing together, I remember uh, he, uh, one of the first incidents that happened, he called me and he said, hey, like, we're good friends on staff at Westgate. He said, David, like, um, is there anything that I can do for you? You know? I haven't shared that publicly, but I still remember that phone call. Dave Tish. You know, hey, um, is there anything with my influence and with the, the positions that God has given me, is there anything that I can do to stand, to help, to serve in any way? And, and as I was kind of reflecting upon this passage, wow, Dave, my friend Tish, he could have taken the posture of Abraham, just said, you know what, that's not my problem, right? That's, that's somebody else's problem. And if I, if I jump in there, I'm, well, then I'm going to get some emails from the church. I, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. But you know what? No, that's not the way of Jesus. I'm going to step in and say, you know what? Like, I, I want to serve. I want to come alongside you. And man, like, boy, God is saying, like, as we reflect upon this text, this is not to actually shame Sarah or shame Abraham for their faults. God is saying, would you use this story as a mirror to your own journey with me? Where are you? All right. The verses follow like this. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, oh, uh, oops. Uh, uh, so so she, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Um, you are responsible for the wrong. And oh, okay, next slide. Your slave is in your hands, Abraham said. Do whatever, uh, do with her whatever you think is best. 
Then Sarah mistreated Hagar, and the word there, mistreated, means, I mean, it, it was a physical, psychological abuse, right? It was a harsh treatment of Hagar, and she fled from her. Like, can you imagine for Hagar, like, I thought I'm in the household of somebody who loves God. Like, this is supposed to be the father of the faith. Like, God's going to use him as one of the key figures, and I'm supposed to be under their protection. But the very people who are supposed to care, protect, and fight for my justice are the very ones that are abusing me. Like, it's, and, and Abraham says, like, it's in your hands. I don't want anything to do with it. I mean, this is the most passive uh, uh, posture that Abraham has ever been in his journey with God. And he sees the mistreatment, and, but He's like, if I step in, then, then my marriage with my wife is going to get awkward. And as you know, happy wife, right? As you, right? Like, you, don't, you, don't want, you don't want that marriage tension. It's like, ah, if I speak against Hagar, I don't want to have another tough conversation with my wife. I want to have a good dinner tonight. Right? I'm not going to rally. I'm not going to get my wife's emotion all stirred up for this. Even though there's an abuse that's happening in my household, I'm just going to let it be. And that's the posture that he takes. So she flees from her. Now we're introduced. So three characters that you see here are, again, once again, Sarah, Abraham, and Hagar. And now I want to invite you to the third character. And maybe if you're like, ah, David, I don't, I'm not sure if I relate to Sarah. Um, control, uh, I'm not sure. Passive? I'm not sure if that's me either. And the third character that God is inviting us to self-examine is Hagar. And Hagar says this, in the verse following, the, Lord, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said to Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going to pass? Look at this. Right? Hagar is being mistreated. She's running away. And for some of us, when pain comes in our way, we tend to run. Maybe that's some of us in this room. So you're not controlling and aggressive blaming. You're not passive. You just run away from things. And I relate to this a lot, too. You're like, why is he preaching? He's, he's, he's dealing with all three. <laughs> yeah, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. <laughs> trying to figure this out with you all. Like, I, I'm reading now Hagar's story. I'm like, ah, I, I do that too. I, I run away from problems. I run away when things get a little bit too rough and, 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 and there's things that are happening. And so now I'm running away. And here is where God, the angel of the Lord, God enters the story. And the, I love this verse. It says this, the angel of the Lord found Hagar. We're not even often looking for God, but God comes after us. Friends, this is the gospel. Our relationships and our journey, we're making mistakes, we're running away, we're hurting others, we're doing all that. But in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the brokenness of the world, God still comes after us. My friends, I mean, that's something worth celebrating. I mean, that is the heart of the gospel, isn't it? While we were still sinners, Christ came. I mean, this is exactly what's happening here. Like, they're not even, they're not even repenting. They're not even confessing uh, of their own brokenness. Like, they are all broken. They're all hurting one another. But in the midst of it all, God's grace enters the story. God's kindness enters the story. God still chases after us even when we don't want to be found. Ooh, that is the gospel. Even, you know, you have stories in your journey where you're not even looking for God, but the Spirit of God comes after you because that's the extent of his love for you and I. And I love that. And I love this question. Slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? Look at this. It's not that God doesn't know where she's come from, right? Like she's, God's, God's seeing everything and she's running away from her pain and all the relational chaos. And God says, wait a minute, where have you come from? Where and where are you going? God is not asking that because God doesn't know the answer to that question. God is asking if you know, if you know the answer to that question. Like where, are you, like, where have you come from? What are you running away from? What are the stories in your life that you're not facing today? And this hits really at home for me because, 
because uh, about three, four years ago, um, like, um, I was working at Westgate, and on a Sunday afternoon, we were on our way to church, our family. And, um, and we're on our way to church. Our services, we were meeting at King's Academy, so it was, it was happening at 5 p.m., and we're on our way. And do you remember about a few years ago, if you're driving on um, 280 and Lawrence Expressway, you know how sometimes there's a lot of traffic? They fixed that road, but before, there used to be a ton of traffic coming out because there's multiple intersections going in. And so we were on Sunday morning, uh, Sunday afternoon, we're going, and we were stuck on a freeway. And, and we were just kind of waiting for cars to go in, and we were right there, and the car behind us was going at 70 miles per hour. Did not see uh, that every, all the cars were stopped and was going full freeway speed. And we were driving, uh, at the time, uh, my wife's uh, college car, t 2003 Toyota Matrix. It's a small, dinky car. And um, if you are a parent in this room, uh, you can all relate. I had two, my, two of my little girls in the back of my car seat. And to be rear-ended, um, a car coming at 70 miles per hour, hitting the back of our trunk, is pretty much a parent's worst nightmare. And um, the car hit us really hard. We didn't see it coming. It ate up all the way to the trunk and it went all the way into the car seats of both of our girls. And um, I hit my head, and I had brain damage, and I, I, was, just, I was losing it all, and uh, we ended up hitting the car in front, and all, our cars were all just kind of crammed in. And um, I, 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 I woke up, I looked at my wife, and I was like, are you okay? And then we, we both looked at it, our, we both looked and said, our children. And we turned around, and, the, and they were, at that time, uh, seven, eight months, and, uh, and three and a half, so really young. And the car seats weren't where they were supposed to be. And for the first time in my life as a parent, did I lose my child? I mean, like that kind of question. If you're a parent, like, or if you have any loved ones, forget, forget being a parent, like if you, right, it's like, it's like, that moment, it's like, oh my gosh. And, and we don't see them, because they just, the car just ate up everything, and we're coming out. And um, by God's grace, um, many cars stopped and rescued us out, and we were able to bring the girls out. It took us, it took for, for me a couple years to recover. I had to, uh, from my brain injury, I couldn't see for about a year. And by God's grace, both of our girls survived. And, um, and it took them about a year to recover, my wife about two years to recover. And so by God's grace, we're all fine. But I share that story not to be emotional here or to say, what does that have to do with anything about this story? I share that story because I was out of work for about a year and I had my girls in the car again and we were going to our 23rd appointment. We had about 20, 23 to 25 appointments a week. Right? We're getting all sorts of treatment, from brain treatment to physical therapy, acupuncture, chiropractic, you name it, right? We're going through all the treatments, and we're on our way, and all of a sudden, I was so mad at God that I couldn't go to work that week. That my title and my position at Westgate Church that I've been working towards, all stripped away, and I'm still, I'm at home, and I was more frustrated. I mean, I'm just being honest here, right? Like, I was so frustrated that I had to take my children, my own children, to the hospital because they are now preventing me from work and my career advancement. And at that moment, God actually brought me to this passage. So this is really personal for me because I reflect upon this passage the whole year or two that I was recovering. God asked me at that moment in the car, David, where have you come from and where are you going? And then I realized that I was running away from my family by performing more at work. I was running away from some of the internal stuff that God was trying to do with me, but I was busying myself so that I didn't have to face it. There, there were some things in our marriage that I had to work through and I had to confess. But like Hagar, I was just running away. Like Abraham, I was just being passive. Or like Sarah, I was controlling my marriage and relationship so that I didn't have to really confess and repent and deal with my issues. And God in his kindness found me in my accident. 
And God said, David, where have you come from and where are you going? And then I realized, God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm just running away. I'm just running away from everything. And, and so I relate. I relate deeply to this text. And Hagar says this in the verses following. I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. And you're like, what is, what is God doing? Is God saying, go back to your abuser? That's not what's happening here. What God is saying is, hey, I want you to go back and face the very things that you're running away from. Friends, Calvary, I don't know where you are in your journey and as you are reading the three kind of characters interacting with one another, my question and God's question to you this morning is this. Where have you come from and where are you going? The angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. I will bless you. I will be with you, God says. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. What the heck? <laughs> like it's so good, right? Like so emotional. God said, I will be with you and your son's going to be a donkey. What? <laughs> is this a curse, God? <laughs> he will be a wild donkey of a man, right? Like, God, I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm crying with tears. And then all of a sudden, you're like, what, what just happened? God is saying, your son is not, no longer going to be a slave. It's going to roam around freely, right? It's actually a blessing, saying it won't be held down. Your son won't be enslaved to a household. Your son will be blessed. And, and but, because he's going everywhere, his twin hand will be uh, against everyone. And, and he will live in hostility towards his brothers because he's free to roam around. She gave, him, uh, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. And she says this, you are the God who sees me. For she says, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abraham a son, and Abraham gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abraham was 80 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So let me leave you with this as I end my time with you. Loving God means this. Loving God means trusting him when it doesn't make sense because he sees you and is always with you. Let me say that again. Like God is saying, like, I'm going to find you no matter where you are in your chaos, at work, at church, in ministry, in your family, in your relationship, wherever you are. Like, it's, things are not making sense. You're like, God, I'm stuck here. God, things are not going well. And God is saying, I see you, I am with you, and I am for you and not against you. But here are the three invitations. Don't take the posture of kind of taking God's responsibility to control things. Don't be passive. Don't run away. But allow me to be in Invite it into your life and say, God, you see me. You are with me. I trust you. I lean into you, God. God, I will not be passive. I will not run away. I will not be aggressive. But God, I will join you, Lord. God, may that be the prayer for this church, that this church here in the valley, that this church will be known as a church that's not running away from problems, that this community will be known as a community that's not controlling and aggressive, that this will be the community known by your kindness, that this community will not be passive to the broken things of this world. I love some of the, all the announcements that were happening, like so many great things that you guys are doing for the sake of the community. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. May this community, may all of you, as you journey with Jesus, may that be the prayer for all of us, that all of us, that we would pause and say, God, as we journey with you, we trust that you see us. We trust that you see this community. We're going through some stuff as a community as well. But God, you see this community. You know what this church is going through. God, you have not left us. You are with us. You see us. And so, God, we will trust you. This church will trust you. Our leadership will trust you. Our families will trust you. And as we do, may the Lord be glorified through this church. May Jesus be honored through the way in which you posture yourself, not as aggressive, not as passive, not as hiding, but posture of saying, Lord, I want to journey this with you. I, I come with open hands. May that be the prayer for all of us. 
at this church. Whew, I'm tired. <laughs> Would you pray with me? Hmm. God, we thank you that you are the God who sees us. God, we thank you, God, that you see where we are in our own lives with you, in the ways in which we Mm, are falling short of the invitation to become more like Jesus. But we thank you, God, that you are still chasing after us, that you are still finding us where we are, and you're saying to us that you have not left us and that you're watching over us and you're guiding us, God. We thank you for what you are doing. God, I just pray for all of us, whatever relationships that we will be facing this week, God, I pray that before we say that word, I pray that before we move into some kind of a direction, God, let us pause as a community to say, God, what would you do? And what do you want me to do in this situation? God, we pray, God, against the controlling spirit that, that remains in our, in, our, in our culture today, that we actually wanna be more like God and we wanna take control. God, we confess that and we say, Lord, we want to be a people that surrender. God, we pray against kind of the passive spirit that is in our culture today, where when we see wrongdoing, because we don't want to cause much conflict, God, we just close our eyes. God, I pray that this church would open its eyes. God, I pray that Westgate would open our eyes. God, that the churches in the barrier will continue to open our eyes to the brokenness of this world and we would act in compassion and love. God, there are things in our lives that we are running away from. God, I know in this room, God, in my own life, in my marriage, I just had a fight with my wife yesterday about something. Like there are things that I'm just running away from. God, give us the courage to stand and to confess. Give us the strength to say, I'm sorry. Give us the strength, God, to say, I'm wrong. And God, I wanna get better. God, would you continue to shape us, Jesus, more and more into your image. That is the prayer. God, we thank you for this story. We thank you that Genesis 16 isn't shown to shame us, but to invite us to become more like you. So we thank you for the grace and the invitation. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.